Thanks for uh, joining us today at uh, the first of our BWI talks for this year, Island SOS. My name is William Campbell. I'll be your host for this, uh, this afternoon's presentation. So this eight-part series focuses on innovative, sustainable ocean development initiatives in island nations around the globe. This is the second installment of this Island SOS series, and we have our first installments available on the BWI YouTube page, which you can review. And this too will be live streamed and then aired on the YouTube page as well. So each presentation in this Island SOS series covers a different island and topic. It will highlight the unique perspective and involvement that islands have on ocean conservation, and it will showcase the different practices that they've undertaken to safeguard the surrounding ocean. BWI, of course, appreciates the generous support of Chubb Bermuda, the exclusive sponsor of this series. Island SOS aligns with Chubb's mission to promote a healthy and sustainable planet, to strengthen the resilience of communities, and to protect biodiversity against the effects of climate change. So today is the first presentation in our series, and it focuses on the sustainable ocean strategy undertaken by Iceland, undertaken by Belen Garcia Ovide, the founder and project manager of Ocean Missions, and the junior fellow at Safina Center. Ocean Missions is an innovative NGO born in Iceland in 2019 that offers annual expeditions in Iceland and the edge of the Arctic regions aboard Opal, an elegant 24-meter topsail electric-powered schooner. Opal is a seaworthy traditional sailing vessel and the biggest sailing boat in Iceland. Born from the need for sustainable tourism and conservation in the unique and fragile environment encompassing Iceland and the nearby regions, the expeditions are open to people from around the world with an interest in protecting the ocean and sailing expertise and scientific experience is not required. So please join me in welcoming uh, Belen Garcia Ovide from Ocean Missions. Hello, can you hear me or everybody and see me? Thank you, Belen, we can see and hear you. So you've got a uh, presentation to share with us today. I'm gonna uh, turn it over to you and please. Thank you, let's see. Okay, all good. Shall I start? Yes, indeed, Ellen, whenever you're ready. <laughs> okay, thank you. So, um, okay. Um, yeah, well, first of all, uh, thank you very much for uh, being there behind the screen. Um, I cannot see you, but uh, I guess I will see you later. Um, for now, I'm going to just uh, go ahead with my presentation. I'm very excited to, to be uh, sharing uh, the project we are uh, working on. And um, so my aim today is just uh, yeah tell you a little bit about uh, what's going on in Iceland and the situation we have here and hopefully inspire some of you to take actions and uh, keep working for ocean conservation. So just a little bit about uh, myself. So I'm a marine biologist, but uh, I come from Madrid, actually, which is the capital of Spain. Um, we don't have uh, oceans. Uh, so I don't know where I got this deep passion for the ocean, but it's something that I always have felt very inside me, and I've been always trying to explore this feeling. Um, I had the chance to go to the university um, to study biology first, and uh, I think it's a fantastic career uh, because basically you can understand like life in general from all different perspectives and angles, and I think that's really beautiful. Um, then I moved to the Canary Islands, which is the, it's a Spanish territory, but it's uh, in the west of Africa, like an archipelago of islands. Um, and I've been uh, working there for uh, two years uh, to finalize my degree in different ocean conservation projects. And that's where I really realized uh, who I am and what do I really want to do in life, which is, uh, yeah, dedicate myself to, to protect the oceans and all my marine biodiversity. So since then, I've been really doing a lot of stuff. Uh, um, there I can, uh, you can a little bit read the, the background and experience. Uh, really, pretty much, I love to be, uh, yeah, in the sea, um, um, yeah, with different uh, approaches uh, and uh, different parts of the, of the planet. These are a little bit more working fields, so citizen science education and outreach. Um, of course, as a marine biologist, uh, one of our roles uh, is to translate science uh, uh, into a language that is uh, understandable for everyone. I mean, reading uh, scientific papers is not particularly very fun, uh, even for, for scientists. 
So somebody has to translate those uh, difficult readings into something inspiring and beautiful and so that people can get also uh, hooked in. No? And that's, that's our role. I mean, there is a lot of education involved and engagement and divulgation, which is a very important part of being working for ocean conservation. Um, one of the ways to do this is actually through tourism. Um, I've been working as a whale watching guide since 2014, uh, mainly in Iceland, um, but also in Greenland, uh, in, in sailing expeditions and other parts. And uh, this is a nice opportunity to educate uh, not only all the tourism that join this, uh, these uh, expeditions, these tourism adventures, but also to um, encourage the companies to actually uh, improve and do uh, more steps towards sustainability, because that's actually very key uh, towards sustainable development and especially, yeah, the tourism that it's, if not well managed, it can be really a big problem for, for, um, for the environment, right? So um, then, of course, marine research. So I've been um, mainly involved with whales, but uh, I had the luck. I mean, it's not like I was specifically looking for it. But um, yeah, so I've been working on whale ecology and distribution uh, studies. I did my master's in Iceland here in marine and coastal management. And then I was already working as a guide. Um, in Iceland, and I was very concerned about how much impact are we doing um, just being out there uh, trying to get uh, nice encounters with these animals, but how much are we disturbing, how much are they complaining, how they complain, so I was just very curious. So I did my research on noise pollution, I was uh, investigating the noise coming from the whale watching uh, boats and, and also studying if there was any change of behavior in, in humpback whales in this case, no? which is one of the most uh, common uh, whale species that we see here in Iceland. Um, then I was working, I still work in, in plastic pollution uh, since 2019 through ocean missions, which I'm going to explain, uh, of course, in the next slide. And very recently, I was also engaged um, in a quite interesting project about environmental DNA. This is very cool because um, it's a very uh, good way to study marine biodiversity. Uh, until now, um, many um, aspects of the of the research on, on on marine biodiversity has been using invasive techniques. For example, when you want to study like fish uh, stocks uh, or abundance of fish, it's being based on on fish that is already captured by fishing boats or even whales in Iceland. Uh, you know, we've been like justifying whaling uh, or whale hunting for scientific purposes. So this is something that if we can avoid, it will be much better, especially considering all the threats that we have in the marine life already. So this method is actually uh, really useful because it's a non-invasive method. And simply by cutting like wa uh, water samples, we can actually look at the uh, environmental DNA and we can identify all the species that has been in these waters recently. Um, so it's definitely uh, an interesting thing but uh, it just got started, so I cannot tell you more about, <laughs> about that. But let's change the world. So um, that's why we are all here, I guess. Um, I really like this explore, love, protect approach. I believe that the people that is working on really protecting um, the environment is because you know we really feel it and we need we feel the urge and the role and the responsibility. But it is also because we are in love with what we're doing. Otherwise, it will be more difficult, you know, to get that thrive to work on ocean conservation. So, and in order to fall in love, you know, with what you're doing, but also with the places you are involved with and the species you work with is by exploring. So that's what I've been doing a lot as well, just going into places, exploring, especially remote areas um, that are difficult to access. Um, here I put pictures of Greenland, for example. This is like, um, yeah, Greenland. Uh, I've been also working in Antarctica um, in this wonderful ship, so and in Caribbean areas and so on. I've been exploring mainly by boat, of course, and that is a very cool way to explore. Um, and that's where also I uh, I develop a really big passion for sailing. So um, yeah. 
But I'm going to talk a little bit about OSHA missions. I think uh, there was already a very nice introduction, so thank you for that. Um, so we began our efforts in 2019 because there was a really deep need for more conservation and sustainable tourism in, in these Arctic regions. As you know, the Arctic has a fundamental role for uh, climate on Earth, so it is, um, it is fundamental to, to work for, for Arctic protection. And we are uh, basically here. Iceland is just there in the middle of the Atlantic, but 66 north in latitude. So we are basically by the Arctic Circle. This is the line of the Arctic Circle. And this is Husavik, where we are based. So basically, it's like a very um, good, good and strategic point uh, for, to work on ocean conservation, because we have access to the Arctic in, in a rel relatively easy way, and especially using the citizen science approach. This is Ursavik, where I uh, live most of the time, as, uh, let's say, one of my bases. I'm, uh, I'm terribly sorry, Bill, and I hate to interrupt. I've just had a question from the audience. Um, they they okay. just put in a request just to uh, slow down the pace um, of the speech. Just a tiny bit. I'm terribly sorry. <laughs> ah, okay, no worries. Sorry. I was no just worries, just for understanding it. Thank you. So this is Ursavik. This is where I live uh, most of the time. It's a small fishing town. Uh, with 2,500 inhabitants. And um, as you can see, it's uh, very cute, it's beautiful. And we have these um, traditional, um, some of them whaling boats that were actually doing hunting whales in the past, but that nowadays they are actually restored as whale watching boats. And uh, since 10 years um, ago, approximately, Iceland and especially all, including Husavik, this area, it's, became, it's becoming really, really uh, uh, popular for, for whale watching. So this area um, is, um, is a very good uh, whale feeding ground. We have different, um, you can see up to 23 different species in these uh, waters, especially in the summertime, it gets, the waters gets really productive in nutrients. So that's the reason why we get these migratory whales. Uh, especially humpback whales and even the, the blue whales. So we actually uh, spotted the first uh, blue whale of the season yesterday. So it's uh, very exciting. And in all this um, um, scenario, uh, Ocean Missions comes as a group, a few, you know, a group of, a small group of, of scientists and sailors that wanted to make a positive change. And our mission is to inspire people to take direct actions to protect the oceans. We do this, as I said, like uh, through a combination of um, education, science, and sailing expeditions in the Arctic. Um, we study whales, seabirds, plastic pollution, and noise pollution from the ship. And these expeditions are open to everyone that really feels the same as us, they, that they feel the, the need to um, uh, or the, the responsibility to take care about our oceans. So it's not basically just tourism, but we also sail with the purpose of protecting and conserve and educate and make a difference. And in this way, we are not only taking from nature by enjoying it and experience it, but we are also giving back. So we are able to use this boat because we are in cooperation with one of the whale watching companies that I work for, and therefore they trust us for using the ship. And in return, we are working uh, on advising them on how they can better improve their environmental policy and their sustainability steps. Um, <clears throat> one of the fields we focus on is in the, in the plastic pollution, both micro and macro plastic. Um, I'm not sure how much in detail I'm going to go into, into this. We can maybe debate uh, a little bit later if you have any specific questions about the numbers. But uh, microplastics are up to 5 millimeters and mesoplastics are up to 10 millimeters. And this is the size we are focusing on. And for both approaches, micro and macro, we use uh, standardized protocols because only by using these protocols, we can then use this data for actual science, which is uh, very important. Uh, this is just the steps for microplastic research. So we have a manta troll, this device here that we drag from the ship, from Opal, 
and it's on the surface and it's just filtering the water and then we get here the samples uh, then we just have to find there uh, the particles and we do have a stereoscope on board that we use to sort out the particles in types and sizes And the macroplastic, we use OSPAR protocols, um, which is pretty standardized uh, internationally uh, to study uh, yeah, marine litter in beaches. So thanks, thanks to the, um, uh, that we have a boat, we can actually access, uh, have access to very remote areas in Iceland that otherwise it will be very difficult to, uh, to access. Some of the results in microplastics that we've been uh, gathering since we started 2019 and 2020, uh, 20, 2022 um, shows that um, most of the trolls, most of the surveys contain microplastics, 62 out of 70 uh, surveys, and the concentra concentrations were highly variable. This is normal because there is a lot of weathering here, uh, the storms and so on, that also makes the study of microplastic even more challenging in order to estimate how many um, particles are per square kilometer. So it's, it's just variable because of the weathering. And this has been uh, proved also in other areas uh, in the Arctic. But this is actually the first time that uh, that uh, there has been these type of studies here in Iceland. So what I'm saying here is it's it's very new. It's not like you know it's been like a very long term research going on. I mean we started this and we started 2019, but these are then the first uh, results uh, which are of course very relevant to start addressing the issue. Here in this map you can see uh, yeah the efforts. So in orange, you can see the microplastic uh, survey. So where we've been um, doing, uh, where, where, where our efforts took place. And you can see that in this area, we have the biggest efforts, um, both in microplastic and macro plastic, which is the green spots. And this is simply because we are based here. And so then we can use the whale watching boats and uh, as platforms to actually get uh, more information. No? Regarding the types of microplastic, uh, we find mainly fishing lines uh, or lines that is coming from the fishing industry, uh, which is indicating that there is still a big influence from the fishing um, pressure uh, um, when it comes to abundance of microplastic. And then we find uh, fragments which are often very difficult to know where they come from. And also paints that we don't know if the paint could be from our own boat or from other sources. But in any case, it's very relevant to see that it is actually a really high percentage of the total um, samples that we find. When it comes to marine litter, this, uh, this graph represents here a little bit how we started and how our efforts have been increasing a lot through the years. This is because um, we, in 2021, the government realized finally that we were doing something quite meaningful because nobody was really paying attention of, on how much trust is in our coast. And even if Iceland is considered to be a very pristine environment, um, you know, a lot of nature and so on, uh, and very few people living here, 300,000 only, it is still a lot of trust. And we can discuss later if you're interested what type or why, uh, how is it arriving here and things like that. But just so you know, here as well, we see that fishing gear, it was the most common type of, uh, of trash and also per volume, like the heaviest. So big nets, uh, buried, some of them really, really old and some of them were new. And of course, some other type of marine litter. But you can see the, the participation, how much increase only in one year. And here we had 166 participations or I mean participants, just volunteers, people that want to help. And here um, 366. 
So this is because uh, the government realized, and since then we've been supported by the government to actually do this research project together and clean uh, the beaches around Iceland. Just mentioning briefly about the local project. So after we do this exp these sailing expeditions, and that's the only income that, or 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 like a stable income that uh, that comes to the NGO. And there we used uh, that uh, those savings to to support local education and do uh, workshops and um, uh, bring awareness to the small communities because that is very important. So we are doing different activities, uh, trust to treasure. Uh, we try to um, transform part of the trust we find in the beaches into something fun, something that people get. Uh, people can develop, can create some type of art, and this has been also shown in different um, exhibitions uh, in in Husavik. Um, and then we have different campaigns to protect the specific uh, sp species. For example, the Atlantic puffin that is suffering from uh, uh, climate change and local hunting as well. And to finalize, I would like to highlight. This project we're working on, uh, this is actually probably the most exciting thing it happened uh, until now. Um, we managed to, to, together with Mission Blue, which is this organization you have here that is led by Sylvia Earl. Um, this organization is uh, doing a really important mission, which is creating hope, hope spots all over the world. Hope spots are uh, marine areas that are critical for, for, um, for ocean protection because of the biodiversity. So we were working together for the last two years in order to declare the first hope spot in Iceland, which is just here where we are based and considering the bay where we see all these whales up to the Arctic Circle here where we have Grimsey Island and the next fjord where we have also unique deep water ecosystems. So this was a big achievement, good step, and we are very excited. This year we are promoting the declaration of the hope spot with Mission Blue, and that's the reason why we will be also hosting a specific expedition with the, uh, only around this area in the hope spot, um, also to gather scientific uh, data to promote the protection of this area and create the first uh, one of the first marine protected areas in Iceland. So. Yeah, if you would like to know more about the project, here you have the connections. And now I would like to maybe share with you the video that um, I was preparing for you and that maybe somebody would like to play it. And yeah, thank you very much for your time and attention. Yes, indeed. Thank you so much for that, Belen. <laughs> Not sure if you can hear, but we do have audience applause. <laughs> yeah, I heard a little bit. <laughs> I may also ask for an audio check on the video that we're playing. So, oh, Belen, Terry, sorry, yeah. asking asking just for an uh, for an audio check on the video as we played it. Yeah, it's just uh, it was displayed. We couldn't hear it just now. Yeah, I, I don't know. I don't see or I don't see or hear the video. No worries. Two seconds, folks. We're just working through a, uh, a video difficulty. In the meantime, actually, Bellin, I just wanted to ask, uh, just maybe before uh, the video comes in, um, just. If you could give us just 30 seconds of, of, of just uh, an idea of why uh, the microplastics uh, research in particular is so important, um, just to illustrate maybe for, for our audience why microplastics is becoming such a significant issue for our oceans. Yeah. Um, I mean, of course, um, uh, well, there is many issues with, with plastic, obviously. One of the maybe direct impacts is the... Uh, by ingestion of uh, of uh, of the marine life, uh, for example, we see a lot uh, this in 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 whales that ingest plastic uh, by accident, and then 
their stomachs are full of plastic and then they eventually die. So in whales, this is uh, something quite common. Um, also, we have, I'm talking in general, right? But also in Iceland, um, entanglements, there, is a, there, has to, there has been actually a research specifically about this uh, whale entanglement with fishing gear here in, in the bay. And they found, uh, well, this was also through ocean missions, like a friend of mine. And she found that uh, around 30% of them, they were having um, um, events of, you know, incidents with uh, fishing gear, at least once in their life. So that's one. And then, of course, we know that in terms of like the microplastic, you know, the macro it degradates with the weather and the time, you know, it takes really, 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 really long time to, to finally disappear. But it doesn't really disappear, it just degradates and breaks up in small particles. So then these particles uh, come perhaps uh, also ingested by the smaller um, uh, organisms in the food web, but also uh, the big ones and those uh, microplastic particles they are still like under research under you know investigation but they can release uh, uh, toxics and um, and components that are are um, are dangerous for 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 the health so like mutations and disorders and uh, neuro, neuro, neural diseases etc fertilization problems and so on so it gets Pretty complicated. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Bella. I believe uh, the video is ready as well, if we can roll that. Thanks. I think it's up to my generation to make it or break it. So I think it's really cool that so many people are interested in trying to do a difference and save the ocean. My expectation is to have a lot of fun and learn a lot. Do some good science and hopefully not find too much plastic. We all know that microplastic is in the ocean, but I feel like if you really see it, it's something else. And I, I just want to see how dramatic it is. I arrived to this beautiful boat. It's incredible. I'm really looking forward to being out on, on the sea. I'm nervous, but I'm super excited because I've never sailed before. I've been on boats before, but never for such a long period of time. I'm just excited. I'm sure it's going to be great. Uh, I'm just hoping to see a whale. <laughs> I don't expect him to come our way, but I, I really hope that I finally meet this beautiful creature. Ocean Missions is a non-profit organization established in 2019 in uh, Husavik, Iceland. Our main purpose of the NGO is to inspire people because we believe that with inspiration, change can be made. And uh, basically, we are in a cooperation with a whale watching company called uh, North Sailing. So thanks to North Sailing, we are using uh, Opal, our main platform to arrange scientific expeditions. And basically, we want to involve everyone to make their contribution. We believe that scientists play a, a very big role in this, but the general public as well. So we need to join forces and act all together. For me, it's important to also inspire others because a lot of my friends and people in my surroundings are scared to get out of their comfort zone and spread the word about the problems in the oceans and marine life. It's only day one, we've literally just started the trip and there's like humpback whales all over the place. It's truly magical. This is just the beginning, so it's gonna be it's, it's epic. I can't even believe like this is happening and we get to experience it. It's just so amazing. I, I don't even have words to describe it right now. How's the treasure hunt going? Oh. <laughs>
but we went to clean a beach that we have cleaned previously, I think eight months ago. When you first look at it, you think, oh, it's beautiful and clean now, and we're so happy about that. And then we started walking our 100 meter survey, and it just turned out that we collected over 350 kilograms of trash off the beach, and most of it was a lot of fishing gear. And so once you start looking a little bit closer, it's always coming back, unfortunately. So it really looks like a, like a tree root system, actually, but it's just fishing gear. Oh, gosh. There is so much more. I understand why they call it a mission now. To see remote beaches scattered with plastic and all the garbage that um, touches you. I live next to the coast, so there's some really beautiful marine environments. And when I heard how bad the plastic pollution had gotten, I realized that I don't know how much longer those coastal environments will last. And that really made me sad to think that I could maybe move away and visit my hometown again and they might not be there. And a lot of people only see these beautiful environments through TV. Maybe they've never even seen the ocean. And I just feel that I want to be a part of this and I really want to help preserve these for a long time to last. I definitely think that slow travel and traveling with a purpose is the future. I think that more people are becoming aware of their impact on the environment and on the oceans and that when they want to travel to beautiful places, why wouldn't they want to make a difference and participate in something that is good for the environment and good for them to learn also. We need everybody in the same boat, so to speak. So you need this conversation to include as many people as possible. And that's kind of what I would like to be able to do with this Ocean Missions project. If individual awareness uh, grows and increases and everyone becomes more sustainable in daily behavior, this is how this critical mass uh, wins eventually. And this is how we can make a positive change in the world, I think. Uh, rather than waiting for things to happen, I think we should just start by ourselves and this is how we we'll change our own reality. We can start small and hopefully it, it grows bigger. The more you know about our planet, the more you'll love it and you protect what you love. Thank you for sharing that with us, Bowen. That was really, really, really fantastic to see. Certainly enlightening, I think, for a lot of us here. Um, just before I turn over to uh, to audience questions, um, I just uh, once more, uh, if I may, I, just a question of my own. Um, earlier, you'd spoken, Belen, um, about uh, the ideas of bringing scientific research uh, into into somewhat more layman's terms uh, to help scientific research be understood by uh, folks that may not be as versed. Um, in the scientific literature awareness as, as, as you perhaps might be. I was just wondering if you could possibly uh, quickly go over the terms of uh, slow travel and traveling with a purpose that were, uh, were highlighted in the last video. Um, sorry, I, I, the, the connection went off. I didn't hear the question. I'm terribly sorry. 
No worries, that's okay. Um, I was just wondering if you could possibly explain the concepts of, of slow travel and traveling with a purpose a little bit better for our audience. Yeah, um, well, um, I guess it's just a way to offer like an alternative to to regular tourism, right? Um, and also like consider all these people that is really eager to, to do something, but uh, they are not sure how to do it. Like, I have heard this so many times, like, I just want to do something, but I just, I cannot do anything. And that's very wrong. I mean, everybody has some power, you know, we have more power than we think. And uh, it's just about thinking, yeah, uh, from my situation, uh, what, what it's meaningful, what I can do, no? And I think just the simple fact of just contributing to this type of tourism, which is sailing, you know, with a purpose, you are doing a lot because uh, because you are giving to nature. You are supporting uh, projects like this one, and uh, that's already a lot. And and if you get inspired, then you will tell everyone, and then everyone will be like maybe you know, as, uh, highlighted by by you and like hopefully um, spreading. No, and uh, and I think it's a uh, it's a uh, it's the moment. It's the right moment now to to do this uh, type of tourism because. As I said before, tourism is a. Uh, it's 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 okay. I mean, but we need to be very aware of where do we put the line, like especially when we talk about nature-based tourism. Um, you know, people. Many people maybe you know they don't have the chance to see uh, whales. So they went to zoos and that was, uh, of course, that's not good. So then the alternative is just to go to their environment, like the marine, like the ocean and just see them. Okay, great. And that's a little bit uh, how whale watching started. But uh, um, we need to still think that we are in their home and we just have to be respectful. And um, yeah, there is a... Uh, a lot of sustainable tourism now and i think uh, we also need to be careful what 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 it, what it is sustainable because many uh, companies they they say they are sustainable but if there are too many companies and they are all sustainable how can that be sustainable right so it's it's a uh, it's difficult sometimes to to <laughs> to with all this um, this tourism but uh, the slow slow travel is basically uh, don't rush, just uh, just be more aware and feel more. Instead of seeing more in, in short time, visiting more, moving here and there and check, you know, have your checklist, da, 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 da. It's more about being more in the present, value more the moments and uh, and travel slow, not, not in a rush like we normally see in tourism. Like, for example, cruise ships is a good example of mass tourism that is just going really fast everywhere and stopping really very small time on places and that's not giving much to the local communities and that is a problem and uh, that's why you know sailing boat and especially opal that it's like a hybrid so it's like um, powered by batteries it's, it's like not emitting co2 emissions um, and but just a, any sailboat you know small sailboat it's pretty much very slow. I mean, it's not more than, than nine knots with luck and, and a lot of wind. So that is uh, a good way to support um, slow travel rather than cruise ships or flights, for example. Wonderful. Thank you, Bellin. And if I may, I'm now going to turn over to the audience for any questions. Anyone that would uh, like to share anything with Bellin or ask a uh, point of clarification? Thank you. I, no, now I, I see you guys. concerned about the um, amount of plastics that are in the ocean affecting the food. I mean, if we're, if we're trying to buy wild caught salmon, etc., uh, is that contaminating, contaminated by the plastic? Uh, yes, um, of course. I mean, uh, that is what is happening everywhere. I mean, we are not talking here about that this is a problem for the marine life. This is a problem for us. I mean, we are part of the system in this planet. We are all connected and we are connected by the oceans. That's the reality. That's why also the, the, the trust 
here, no, doesn't maybe necessarily means that it's trust from Iceland, but it can come from anywhere from 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 all parts in the world because the oceans are connected with currents and the climate. And you know, food webs in the ocean, I mean, you know, the big fish eats the small fish, and the small fish eats the smaller even fish, and so on. And so uh, and plastic is every way now. I mean, it's just like really overwhelming the numbers. I mean, it's been found in, in everywhere they've been researching pr pretty much. Like here in Iceland, it's been in ice icebergs, uh, but it's been also in, in like uh, the stomachs of, of seabirds, sea but in humans, it's been seen also in blood, in brains, of, in the human brains. I mean, up to that super tiny level, you know, in the blood and in our, and it's in our bodies. I mean, I don't know, there is this research uh, that uh, says that uh, we are just eating like a credit card of plastic every, I don't know, month or something. Like, it's crazy. And of course, it's in the fish. But, you know, it's just so tiny that we just don't see it. It's just, they are... <laughs> the it's it's getting so one is the particles are so small it gets in the blood and and that's is when it's releasing these components um that are maybe very toxic for for us you know but but it's still like uh yeah so many questions that we don't know exactly how or when are we going to start seeing the real effects in 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 humans no because we are not eating plastics, like like what happened with uh, marine life, which is interesting, uh, because people say, why cannot they just distinguish what is plastic and what's not, no? like a turtle, for example. And so it happens that in the ocean, the plastic gets um, uh, covered by microorganisms, by algae, you know, with the time. And that creates such a smell, you know, that the animals, they have the capacity to smell from very far away. And that's why they are, you know, going for this, this uh, whatever has that smell, they just feel that it's food, they just eat it. And that is why many times the animals, they end up having such a big amounts of plastic in their stomachs. I don't know um, if I answered the question. <laughs> I think you did, certainly. Um, anyone else uh, from the audience for you? I do. Um, well, first of all, thank you very much for the presentation. I think it's very beautiful. Oh, a bit closer. Um, thank you very much. Um, my question is, obviously, you have all the tourists and people coming out and helping you find all these plastics, and you see a lot of it being as a result of fishing and things like that. But my next step would be, well, what can we do about that? Because obviously, we can't help with removing the fishing nets because that, that's not our trade and things. So what are the next steps that come out of all this work and research you're doing to reduce that? So it's wonderful it's being cleared up, but what happens now? Yeah, of course, uh, that's a very good question. Um, um, you know, what we are doing is just a part of it. It's a piece of the parcel. We are cleaning the beaches, but we are also creating a lot of awareness, which is, again, very very important so as we do as much as we can do um but now for example i believe it was uh, very very meaningful for us that the government actually was listening you know because 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 we were doing all these educational activities and so on and iceland is also pretty small somehow this was uh, received by the government and the government decided to support us financially for some years with this. So I think that was great, but it's true that it's not a solution. I mean, it's just a very puntual, puntual thing. Um, governments need to uh, take decisions to, to reduce the plastic because for many trusts that we will clean, if we don't close the source, it's absolutely useless. But we cannot take decisions, we are not politicians, but we can really uh, um, show the situation as it is. This is what we have. Do you want this? Do you want this for the tourists? I mean, we are showing pictures of uh, beaches full of trash and they, of course, uh, you know, they are not going to like that tourists are here and they see all the trash, for example. 
So there is a there is an interest, growing interest slowly by the governments in in cleaning and also in reducing plastic. Um, and I think internationally this is happening. And it needs to be a work in cooperation, you know. Uh, NGOs, companies, they have a lot to do. Company, for example, I work in my in the in North Salem in the whale watching company. I am advising them on how can they replace the plastic they use for some alternatives. So from the company's perspective, there is something you can do. From the individual perspective, you can do a lot uh, in your daily life to replace the plastic or reduce it because it's more important to reduce than to replace because the recycling system, unfortunately, it doesn't really work. And that is, um, it's uh, it's uh, very terrible, but it is like that. I mean, it, it works really badly. And so what it will be best and more efficient is just reduce, to reduce the, the plastic use uh, everywhere. And referring to your question, uh, we are, uh, one of the next steps that we are actually uh, trying to do is to be able to to use all these um, nets that we find the big ones and recycle them because it's very sad to see that you are taking tons and tons of trash from the beaches then you put them in the recycling center here but that doesn't mean they are going to be recycled because again recycling is very difficult in general and uh, here we are relatively lucky in Iceland because I learned that the because it's very cold waters, so the trash doesn't get uh, dirty. Like with, um, it, it's pretty clean what we find, which means that the chances of recycling are better for these nets. So what we are doing now is to find a partner, like a in industrial partner that would like to to take these nets and that they have the facilities to to recycle the nets and produce shoes or. Um, um, furnitures or whatever, but that we can give them a, a new use. And that is also circular economy, which is very important, which means uh, we just don't do things. If we do things like a company, if we we're a company and we do um, an impact to the environment, we have to compensate that impact somehow. So this way of thinking that, okay, I um, I use these nets, but then I have to recycle the net. Otherwise, I'm not going to use it. So then we reduce our impact in general. And that goes with the CO2 as well, for example. Like you go flying somewhere, there is like emissions, and then you do something to compensate those emissions back. That is thinking circular. And I think that's also the future. <clears throat> I have a question as well, but thank you. That was a very interesting presentation. I love the description of the slow travel as well. Um, okay. Question I have is you, you are doing some incredibly valuable work there. Can you talk about how connected or networked other organizations are and volunteers um, around the world doing that kind of work? So sharing results, sharing research and working together, together please. Oof. Uh, well, I think um, um, so here in, in Iceland, I think we are pretty um, unique, I would say. I mean, when I started this, I was surprised that there was nothing like this going on. Uh, so I think that's one of the reasons why it got a lot of momentum, you know, this and more and more I see um, more people interested and and uh, and that's great you know that's that's really rewarding uh, i think also internationally there's been a lot of efforts um i mean i think so i, I mean of course then uh, things are not maybe you know every every case is different every place is different um the way of working might be different, so it depends a lot on what kind of setup you have in in a specific place and the connections, like you say, I, I think that's very important. I think um, we are very lucky here because um, we have a lot of challenges, but we also have a lot of opportunities. Um, we have the tourism here, but we also have a little research center, uh, which um, it's studying whales here and uh, there are like uh, students coming from all over the world to study whales here every year. We have the incredible whale museum here in the small town. 
and um, we have STEM projects. Um, we have um, uh, all these, um, you know, whale watching um, operators. We have the local fishermen, and it's all in a very small town. So then it's just very easy to work together. And uh, likely, I think, and through the years, because we've been here many years, then you have, you are getting the trust of people. I'm a foreigner here. I'm not Icelandic. If someone comes from outside and suddenly starts telling people what to do, that's what Iceland probably hates the most. Um, you need to, and I'm talking from my experience, but I think this is a very important thing actually for uh, all the places. You need to first uh, know the place you are, understanding the challenges, the opportunities, get the trust from people, and then you have a ground to start working. And for me, it took me many years of being here, a lot of persistence, you know, to, to be able to get these connections and this networking. Um, but uh, I, I think there is very good projects going on uh, out there. And um, I think uh, sometimes, you know, we don't see that as much um, maybe in the news because they don't want us to see the, they don't want us to give, give, give us hope. In the news, it's, it's uh, dramas mainly and uh, very few times you are going to see, you know, interesting or inspiring projects. But if you start looking, there is definitely a lot of things going on and uh, it's pretty cool. And I think also the governments in general are, are giving more funds uh, for ocean conservation because now there is a lot of pressure to protect 30% of the oceans by 2030. And just today, actually, there was this uh, new agreement that came that was uh, about protecting the high seas so that the nations now they decided that they're gonna protect 30 percent of the of the of the international waters so there is a lot of momentum now and there is almost no time to react because the oceans are really struggling and plastic pollution is only one problem so i think yeah there's definitely a lot of efforts going on wonderful thank you Bailen. i think i've got time for just one more question um, i believe the gentleman here had his uh, hand raised um, yeah, thank you, uh, Belen. Can you hear this? Good. Yes. Okay. I... okay. Um, yeah, I really like the uh, the passion uh, you're showing and uh, the realism also as to things are not perfect and we really need to do something. Um, I happen to work with uh, developing new materials that are alternative to plastic, but I'm not going to go into that um, for for now. But um, I am curious as to if you see along um, the lines of the previous question. Uh, do you see that also being research done on the pH and the lowering of the pH of the oceans um, where you are, uh, maybe other organizations? And then also the, um, the number of planktons per cubic meter or the amount of plankton, uh, because, you know, the plankton eats nanoplastic and some microplastic and die as a result of it. Um, and so... Uh, those two areas would be interesting to see if there is people working on that as well. And then, of course, uh, if you in the future um, plan to develop capability to um, uh, look beyond uh, three uh, millimeter sizes down towards nanoplastic, because then it would be possible to show the enormity of the problem when you can start to uh, get into the numbers uh, of millions, uh, you know, per relatively small area. Those are my questions. Thanks for the, thanks for the question. Um, I'm gonna um, maybe start with the last thing uh, regarding plankton and regarding the size that we choose for microplastic. This is uh, something that we choose that we were gonna look into uh, a size um, um, not not smaller than one millimeter size microplastic. We chose this because we are doing citizen science. So it's good that you mentioned like the realism part because this has to do with that. So it happens that when you look at smaller particles than one millimeter, the risk of potential contamination of your samples increase exponentially. And that's why we decided to stick with one millimeter because then uh, it's still possible to use the citizen science approach and have 
people that not necessarily they are not scientists but they are coming with us and so that they can uh, do the sampling as well and be involved so that is the reason why we chose the size and also it gets really complicated when it comes to smaller and also more expensive and because we are not an oceanographic institution we don't have a lot of money we just have to be realistic and uh, we just show that there is a there is microplastic pollution we provide the first studies and now hopefully there will be like more and more uh, yeah uh, diving into into this uh, other research questions that are of course very important i don't think there is anybody looking at, at uh, nanoplastic at the moment and in plankton um but definitely it will be uh, very interesting we are actually looking at plankton but uh, because the actual uh, device we use, this, this troll, you also get plankton there. And we have been uh, monitoring um, the plankton we have in terms of groups of organisms and uh, weight. But uh, that's what we can do. Uh, we were hoping that somebody will come to help us to, um, to do some plankton research, you know, with this data. Uh, but for the moment, our cap capability to work, it's, uh, it's that. We just focus on the microplastic. We don't have more, uh, yeah, we cannot embrace more at the moment because also if we were doing only research, right, but we are doing the research, we are doing the citizen science programs and we are doing the education and that takes really a, a lot of effort and it goes into the three pillars. So we cannot unfortunately spread much. Um, there is a freshwater a marine research institute here in Iceland doing most of the marine research in, in marine biodiversity or species. Uh, I know they do plankton research, but not microplastics in, in, in plankton. Uh, the problem is, and they also do this pH, pH um, studies and yeah, more things related with oceanography. Uh, the problem has been in cooperation with them, uh, the cooperation with them, because uh, um, they are very like, so um, they work for the government. And that is, I think, the reason why they don't really want to cooperate necessarily with, uh, with NGOs like us or, or some other institutions. They are just like government, they provide data for the government, and they are actually the people that tell the, the quotas, like how many fish you can, you are actually able to fish uh, based on the research they do. So it's a quite uh, limited <clears throat> for us to, to, to get access to the data also because it's mainly in Icelandic. Um, and, um, but uh, I think, uh, I'm not fully aware of how much, uh, yeah, of that data because of that reason, like they don't really share much, but definitely we know that uh, warming ocean is an issue here. And we have seen that uh, very, um, it's very obvious when you look especially at seabirds because they are very good indicators for marine, marine uh, health, ocean health. And in our case, for example, the Atlantic puffins that are one of the most popular seabirds they've been decreasing in numbers significantly because warming ocean moving off their main prey and therefore they are not successful on hatching um, in the summertime. So, yeah. <laughs> I hope that answered your questions there. Um, I'm, I'm terribly sorry, folks. I know we'd, uh, we'd love to ask questions of Belen all day. I certainly would, um, but I'm afraid we are uh, running to the end of our time for uh, today. Um, I'd like just to ask you all to uh, join me in thanking Belen for uh, taking the time to share her uh, presentation and insights with us today. You can, if you have questions, you can send me an email as well. Um, yeah, or just go to Ocean Mission Island and you can reach me easily through there. So thank you very much for your questions. I really had a good time and uh, yeah, I hopefully see you in Iceland. If you come, let me know. And uh, yeah, thank you very much for the opportunity and good luck with the efforts in, in conservation. In Bermuda. Thank you so much, Valen. Thank you for your time today as well. So it is our hope today that this presentation will inspire and encourage discussion throughout Bermuda and other island communities. 
Thank you also to Chubb Bermuda, the sponsor of our BWI Talks Island SOS series. You can check out the entire BWI Talks Island SOS series on CITV Bermuda and on our B, uh, BWI YouTube channel as well. I'm William Campbell, and I hope you'll in, uh, join us all again at the first Sunday next month when we have Bermuda's own Faye Sapsford introducing some of the work that she's done with the Sargasso Sea Commission.